History can be hard, right? Lots of timelines and players to keep track of, and discussions of the interplay between political, economic, cultural, and military factors can easily become mystifying to the point of incoherence. Imagine the surprise of European farmers who learn that a disruption to tourism in the Holy Land means they have to pay higher taxes to fund a transcontinental war. It's a little tricky sometimes. This is why historians aiming to both lighten the vibe and slim down the amount of narrative knives to juggle may gravitate towards singular narratives about famous figures, rulers, generals, and other such go getters. This is often known as great man history, but it is stupid, and I hate it, because not only is it insultingly reductive and so slavishly wrote that it still somehow manages to be boring, but it tends to blindly glorify characters that, more often than not, are assholes. So let's try something else. We'll ditch the arbitrary concept of greatness and give praise where it's actually due by discussing two good rulers in history, King Cyrus of Persia and Sultan Saladin of Egypt, two noble, genuinely virtuous people who, in a statistical analysis, are not profoundly awful after three minutes of cursory research. Of course, this is not to say that they are blameless. They're monarchs who conquered stuff. Their literal job description involves killing thousands of people to acquire land, and the simple act of ruling necessitates countless choices, big and small, that negatively affect someone or other. My point here is to look at how someone in an innately perilous moral position can nonetheless demonstrate a commitment to virtue. So, to have a little fun with pure biography in such a way that won't make me furious, Curious. Let's do some history. Now let's rewind to the 500s BC and meet our first protagonist in Persia. Well, politically, this whole stretch was under the Median Empire, just east of the Neo-Babylonian Empire in Mesopotamia. According to legend, the Median king Astyages was feeling antsy about a dream that prophesied his overthrow at the small, adorably stubby hands of his as-of-yet unborn grandson. But despite orders for his daughter to kill the child, the itty-bitty Cyrus survived in secret for ten years before being discovered by Astyages. Although the king had been pretty set on his course, a decade earlier, this time he was content to let Cyrus just kinda go home to Persia and exist. In 559, Cyrus inherited kingship of Persia from his father, but they were still subordinate to Media. So in 553, he revolted against his grandfather Astyages and improbably won, conquering Media in 550 and creating the Achaemenid Persian Empire, named after a distant ancestor. From there, Cyrus zoomed, swooping west into Anatolia to conquer the Kingdom of Lydia, pushing east toward the Hindu into Kush Mountains, and then finally into Mesopotamia to topple the Empire of Babylon in 539. Fourteen years after telling his grandfather to scram, Cyrus had an objectively insane amount of territory, with somewhere on the order of 50 million people spread over dozens of cultures. Cyrus was managing Greeks, Phoenicians, Semites, Mesopotamians, Medians, Persians, Bactrians, Parthians, and Indians. And those are all pretty wide descriptors. Listing off all the ethnicities and subcultures of the Achaemenid Persian Empire would leave me here all day. So you might expect someone in Cyrus's position to tell all those people, gross, too complicated. No, no rights for you. Act more Persian, speak my language, and also pay more taxes, because that's precisely what the Babylonian Empire had done. The capital city was rich beyond belief because it was drenched in tax revenue and loaded with treasures from all over the empire, like statues of local gods, which, according to many of these cultures, were the actual gods themselves. And Cyrus was aware that this was not the nicest way to treat one's subjects. When the Persian armies marched on Babylon, Cyrus claimed that the great god Bel had deserted Babylon because of their greed and cruelty, switching his divine favor onto the Persians. Now, let's just take a second to appreciate that Cyrus fundamentally works on the same moral framework as China's Mandate of Heaven. It's obviously not the same thing, but it's clearly a similar thought process, and it definitely informs our reading of his benevolence. So now that Cyrus was in charge of, well, functionally everything, he made some changes, like sending divine statues back to what he called the places that made them happy, which is just so adorably sweet. He also allowed people to go back to their happy places, which is corroborated by a little source known as the Bible. Because after Israel was conquered by Babylon, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and most Jews were deported to Mesopotamia. Cyrus undid all that, allowing Jews to return home and even sponsoring the construction of a new temple to replace the first one. Many Jews were content to stay in big city Babylon, but the migration back to the Levant had a huge cultural and theological impact on Judaism as a whole. The books of Isaiah and Ezra describe how nice it is to be treated like people to 
despite their difference in religion and ethnicity, but if we had more sources from around the Empire, I'm sure we'd have lots of stories like this, as official records indicate multiple repatriation and reconstruction programs. But all this pan-imperial benevolence wasn't just for warm, fuzzy feelings, because Cyrus was extremely pragmatic. He recognized where media and Babylon failed, and knew that the disparate parts of the Empire would be happy if they could practice their customs in peace, and if the economic infrastructure of the Empire brought wealth into the provinces rather than just yanking it out as taxes. So Cyrus and his successors worked to connect the Empire and facilitate trade by building roads, issuing coins, and standardizing weights and measures. After completing his conquests, Cyrus led with kindness and backed it up with actions that would directly ensure the long-term stability and well-being of the Persian state. Man, it is amazing what happens when you actually try! Our next subject won't move us very far, but we will time skip about 1600 years ahead, which lands us in the Holy Land during the Crusades, so I'm already not having fun. Politically, this corner of the world was... Hmm crowded, with crusader states hugging the Levantine coast, and a smattering of small Muslim vassal states sandwiched between the Egyptian Fatimid Caliphate and the Seljuk Sultanate. Our protagonist, Salah ad-Din, was born Yusuf ibn Ayyub in northern Mesopotamia, where he was educated in language, theology, Islamic political and military history, and science. But medieval Muslim scholarship was almost always fantastic, so this really shouldn't be surprising. There was, however, no substitute for experience, and as a young adult, Saladin accompanied his uncle on a campaign to Egypt, where some clever politics, a victory in battle, and maybe assassinating the Fatimid vizier resulted in Saladin becoming vizier of Egypt. And thanks to the fortuitous death of a couple caliphs, Saladin ruled his new Ayyubid Sultanate by 1174. And boy, he could have done a heck of a lot worse than Egypt. Throughout history, the place has been well supplied, interconnected, and extremely rich. So it made a wonderful base of operations from which to go pester the Crusaders. While he was swooping around the Levant and up to Syria, Saladin's main focus stayed on the Christian kingdom along the coast. He obviously had a religious motivation in taking Jerusalem, but this typically theological rivalry had one especially irritating antagonist by the name of Reynald of Châtillon. From the Sultan's perspective, Reynald's singular goal in life was to give Saladin a heart attack from raw stress by breaking every treaty he possibly could and killing innocent pilgrims basically for funsies. Reynald unambiguously sucked, and even Christian sources at the time openly wished for Saladin to get him. In 1183, he did get close when he besieged Reynald's castle at Carrack, but Saladin heard Reynald's stepson and Princess Isabella of Jerusalem had been married in the castle earlier that day and were spending the evening in one of the towers, so he ordered his army to continue the siege but be mindful so as not to disturb the tower. The castle was too well defended, so Saladin withdrew a few days later, but this still shows Saladin's chivalry and his good sense of humor. Just because he was at war didn't mean he was gonna be a jerk about it, but Saladin wouldn't have to wait long to get that Weasley Reynald, or Jerusalem for that matter. In 1187, Saladin besieged the city of Tiberias and baited a crusader army to ride out from Acre in the middle of the summer across a very long road with only one water spring. When Saladin subsequently ambushed the army at the Horns of Hattin, it was already game over. Most of the army was killed or captured, including the King of Jerusalem and Monsieur Reynald. The king was cool, so Saladin treated him with the utmost courtesy, but Reynald was beyond negotiation, so Saladin scolded him for his awful behavior before grabbing a sword and killing him himself. After that, the king was ransomed and sent peacefully home. Although, home is a stretch, because Saladin took advantage of the Crusaders' sudden lack of an army to conquer Jerusalem and almost all of the Holy Land. And in contrast to the Crusaders' massacre of 1099, Saladin took Jerusalem with far less violence and vandalism, ransoming most Christians in the city and letting several thousand just go free. This, of course, prompted a third crusade, pitting Saladin against England's King Richard the Lionheart, but this contest was far more chivalrous. Although Richard executed thousands of Muslim captives in Acre, he was still infinitely better than Reynald. When Richard lost a horse and fell ill at the Battle of Ar Suf, Saladin, who lost that battle, gifted two horses from his royal stables and sent his royal physician to treat the English king. The war soon ended in a treaty that restricted crusader kingdoms to the coast and recognized the capture of Jerusalem, but Saladin offered to allow Christian pilgrims to still visit the
the city. So it's not hard to see why even sources from his adversaries had a deep respect for the man. Both within and beyond their respective empires, Cyrus and Saladin are well-deserving of their reputations. Their political and military accomplishments were plenty already, but it takes a really special figure for even their enemies to praise their underlying character. Generals who fought against Saladin wrote him letters of apology, and then even the Greek writer Xenophon cited Cyrus as the ideal king. To a degree, both of these figures got caught on the other side of an arbitrary East versus West conflict, which is why us Westerners don't know them as well as we arguably should, but despite the unkind bias of various Greek and Crusader historians against Persians and Muslims respectively, the reputations of these two have clearly transcended cultural boundaries as models of what it means to use power for good. Mostly for good. About as good as a monarch can use their power for, all things considered. And heck, maybe recent history is just getting to me, but I, uh, I don't know, I feel like we can maybe learn a little bit from that. Thank you so much for watching. As someone who has very strong opinions about the way monarchs are discussed in history, this was a very fun way to talk about cool characters that we can actually look up to in some key ways. Luckily, history does have a handful of actually good rulers, so I'm looking forward to covering some more in future videos. As always, thank you patrons for supporting the work that we do, and I'll see you in the next video.